Good morning, everyone, and welcome to JA's Recipe for Success. I'm Laurie Salarulo, your host of the show, and I, it's my pleasure to be with you this morning. You know, we started this show so that we could learn about the journeys and the stories of leaders, business leaders, community leaders, entrepreneurs, uh, and for our audience, right, out there on social media, as well as for our students. It's so important for them to hear from people who made it through all kinds of adversity uh, and that they can do it too, right? So we're giving them inspiration and motivation and hearing people's stories and what it took to be successful. And everyone's got their own recipe, right? Uh, and so today's guest, I am thrilled to say, really did make it through lots of adversity and really climbed his way up to uh, success. You know, our guest this morning started off digging pits uh, for a local cable company and then went on to own several businesses. He is a social entrepreneur. He is an author, which we will talk about in a little bit. We'll talk about his book, Labor to Leadership, but please help me welcome this morning, Jeremy Torisk. Good morning, Good. sir. Good morning. How's everybody over there? Everybody is great. It took us a little while to get this schedule, but so thrilled to have you on the show. Um, and, you know, you and I have been getting to know each other over the past several months, but I've never quite heard all of the story. So I'm really looking forward to this this morning, too. And I have read read a lot of your book, um, and so I want. There's definitely some things in there that I want to touch on. Uh, but uh, this morning, what I when by the way we met, I have to just mention this, but we met through the famous Noodleberg Huddle, right? Um, which I've met so many amazing people through, uh, and saw you on there this morning too. Uh, and they were kind enough to call out Patrick this morning for his birthday, so he might join us, lady. You never know; we might get a surprise. Oh, no. A surprise appearance by Patrick Salarulo. Uh, but I want to start because I think, you know, just your introduction, right? Going from digging pits for a cable company to where you are today. Um, you know, give us a couple of highlights. What were some of the turning points in this story? Sure. So really, it starts way back earlier than that as, a gr as growing up as a kid in Hollywood, Florida, right down the street. I went to South Broward High School and I wasn't... Um, I wasn't the most happy of happiest of people. Uh, I was happiest in drumline, right? Playing the drums with all my buddies and in ROTC, um, where it has some discipline and some structure. And uh, when you look back on it, you realize, you know, why you're happy. But the rest of the days, I hated school. I didn't know I was dyslexic. I didn't know I had ADHD. Um, I have a lot of OCD, uh, except I call it uh, C CDO because the letters are in the right order. Uh, but um, <laughs> This stuff didn't get uh, diagnosed until I was in my 40s, actually. Uh, but my parents, they, I just, they were just a young kind of couple, had my sister and I before 20 years old. And it was like the house was like shameless. You know, it's like maybe a, an eight out of 10, if <laughs> shameless is a 10. But it was just party central. Right? No accountability, no um, kind of, you know, of desire to grow in life. My parents are very hard workers. But uh, they had no aspiration. My dad's a truck driver. At 70, he's still a truck driver. Mother was a, uh, my mom was a waitress. And she's not, she's working now, she's 70 also. But um, that's it, right? The advice that I got when I did so poorly in school and I fought every single day because I had very low self-esteem and I just used to <laughs> take it out on everybody who looked at me funny. Um, they would uh, say, listen, just try to get a D or a C. You know, they can't, they got to pass you if you get a D. All right, they can't keep you back. So um, I didn't have aspirations. I met a girl, uh, the, turned out to be the mother of my children. And uh, she's a local Fort Lauderdale girl too, Pompano. She went to Ely High School there. And uh, when we met, I was just out of, you know, I didn't finish school. I was about 17 when I left school, uh, left the house even, went on my own. And I was living in my friends, on my friend's couches and ended up in the friend of mine's like garage apartment kind of conversion deal. When I met Laurel, her stepdad worked for the cable company as a contractor. And I was making $300 a, a week, kind of working on a machine shop in Hollywood, Jet Avion, if anyone's from Hollywood and knows it's still there today. He said, how would you like to make double that? I'll pay you $600 a week to come work for me. And I said, heck yeah. I actually said the worst thing, right? But I said, heck yeah. Didn't even ask what I was going to do. Well, day one, I'm on a ditch digging crew <laughs> And I'm the lowest guy on the, on the totem pole. 
And so we call them pits because they're not really long. They're only about six feet, but you got to do one on each side of the driveway. And then we shot this thing called a missile under the driveway to put a conduit under it. Then the cable company would come behind and replace the bad cable. So I worked all over Davie and Fort Lauderdale and South Florida digging pits. About this time, um, I had an epiphany in my life. So I still kind of walked around my head down. I still actually was fighting a lot, believe it or not, at 20 years old. But what happened was I had a drunken phone call from my grandmother. And it was right after my sister's wedding. And she told me that out of the blue, somebody at the wedding was just running their mouth about how my father wasn't my father. And that, I never knew. I, my dad was with my mother since middle school. So finding out when I'm 20 years old that I wasn't related to, to that kind of DNA actually was freeing to me, liberating. Because again, there was no, you know, no drive. And I kind of had it. I used to cut grass for all my aunts and my grandmother. And I used to just, I, I needed praise, right? I got off on praise. That's what I, I wanted to help people. So I've always had a, a big heart, even though I was fighting a lot. I always felt bad after, right? <laughs> so I did have a big heart, but I just wanted that praise. So I was always helping my uncle build decks and mixing concrete with them at like, you know, five years old. And so it made sense. I was like, wow, now I have like potential, right? It's unknown, but at least the known wasn't any good to me. The unknown was better. Well, I, I went on a quest to find out who my real biological father was because my dad's my real dad. He's still <laughs> in my life, seven years old, but he's not my biological father. I wanted to know what that, this was before DNA, of course, and before the internet, it was 1990. Who was my real dad? It took me two years to find this out. I upset a lot of people. I made a lot of phone calls, wrote a lot of letters, but I finally tracked down this high school principal in this little school, I won't say what state it's in, and I was trying to buy the yearbook because I knew his nickname and I knew what year, you know, how old he was, so I was gonna find him in the yearbook and then find out his real name and then look him up. I was, Pretty good investigating for a young kid, right? Well, the admin didn't know what the heck, how do you get a yearbook from 1969? So she passed me to the principal. Principal went to high school in 1969 and knew that guy. Oh, I know him, yeah, sure, hold on. Let me give you his work number. Didn't ask why, thank God. I called the office after staring at that number for a while. And when the lady answered, she said, law offices of the guy, that's all I needed. Not only now was I not related to like, you know, no, no, no driver thing. I had lawyer DNA. I wasn't dumb. Like everyone told me my whole life on Instagram was dumb. I, you know, a lot of put downs. I wasn't dumb. I have lawyer DNA. So now I think I'm smart. I know I'm smart. I know I have potential and I'm still digging pits at this time. But, you know, um, I have to stop you for a minute because this, I'll keep this going. Is blows my mind because I think about our students, right? And I think about some of our students who come from, right, lower income areas or, or, or less, you know, affluent and have, have, don't have the opportunities. And I think about what you're saying and it makes me think, you know, how many of them think their life is predestined, right? Because of where they grew up or who their parents are and may not find someone, right, or something that that spurs them to, you know, to, to look further and to know that they can be more no matter where you start out from, right? And so I hope if nothing else, our, our students, especially when they watch, understand that that doesn't determine, where you start doesn't determine where you end up, right? And so I love that that story. And I think there's so many kids who go through that. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, and the most important part of that is none of it is actually real. None of it is tangible. My father who raised me is still in my life. I've never met that lawyer guy ever. I talked to him on the phone for two minutes in my whole life. And he's not even alive anymore. I don't even know what he looks like. It's not real. I just had to think it was real. I mean, right. it was real in real life, but it's not anything that I ever got anything from it. He didn't like pay me like back child support for 20 years, which would have been awesome at the time. Uh, I didn't even ask for that. Well, like, that was the thing. Start a business, right? <laughs> oh, that would have been great. Yeah. But it just gave me confidence 
And it, it, it actually gave me not even self-confidence. It gave me, I had a lot of self-confidence. That's why I fought so much because I, I was very confident, but I had no self-esteem. I had no self, self, uh, self-worth. People think high self-confidence equals high self-esteem and they don't. I was a really good drummer because my dad played the drums. I always saw him play the drums. I was a really good fighter. I was a really good dancer because my aunt taught me how to dance. All right. I love to dance. This is my go-to dance. I don't embarrassed of anything. I'm very confident, but I had no self self worth. And I used to just put myself down all the time. So, so, think, so how, so I think a lot of our, our young people go through that. I think a, a lot of us as adults, right? Mm-hmm. We've gone through it. How did you build that self worth? Were there things, people, mentors, how did you build that self worth? is over time obviously so when i went to work with that new you know kind of attitude um there's a story in the book how every morning i would go to work and uh, we met in the parking lot before we went out to work and we just had to wait for the supervisors to give us our routes um and i didn't like talking to the guys i wasn't a very social person really i was uh they all were like you know bsing right who's better who they all drank a lot and i i didn't really drink at the time so i would go sweep the warehouse floor because the warehouse was open, the office, but we were had to wait outside for the managers to come out. So I would go sweep the warehouse floor. I was just bored I, because I had ADHD. I needed to move. And so my my owners, I didn't know this, but the owner used to see that every day. And then I got a promotion and I got another promotion. I was going to installs and then I went to MDU crew. Then I went to, you know, Splicer. And every time I got a promotion, um, I kept sweeping because I just didn't. It was the same thing. I still went to the same office. Still had I didn't want to BS with the guys. So I got those promotions like quicker than some other people because I had initiative. I had, um, you know, I I didn't have to be told to do something. I would just do stuff. And every time they asked me, do I know how to do something? I would just say, yeah, I know how to do it because I knew other people who know how to do it. And then I just go ask them. And so that that was um, I impressed the people who were doing the hiring without knowing it because I wasn't trying to do that. I just had an attitude of gratitude for whatever I had. And I looked at things a lot differently because. Uh, my life was just getting better every year. Just the little thing just kept getting better. Um, you know, trusting the voice in your head and not believing the bad stuff that you're still telling yourself because you have evidence and you have support system in your life. And I started getting no mentors. No, I didn't get mentors until later. And I, I had a whole story about mentorship, how important it is. I was very lucky to have mentors in my life. One of them, the biggest one, Nestor Martin, actually, um, voted kind of against me to give a promotion at Comcast. And I went, I was the youngest promoted construction manager uh, at the time in that the whole region, I was 32 at the time. And uh, the other people who I thought hated me, and they actually didn't like me personally, but they knew I was go get it, no nonsense, punch you in the face to get the work done. They gave me that promotion. Nestor actually voted no, who I'd be working for. Um, and then I turned out to, to run out for, for four years and built $24 million worth of upgrade for Nestor. He is God. He's a godsend to me. He's like my father also. So what what was the turning point when you went from working for all these companies and then became an entrepreneur, which, you know, as you and I talked, you are for sure what we call a serial entrepreneur. So what was your first entrepreneurial uh, adventure? And, and what did it take? Like what? Why did you think you could do this? How did you do it? Well, my first one was actually I was 14 or 15 years old, probably 15. And my buddies were all older than me. All my buddies were older than me. And uh, (laughs) they had cars and and vans and stuff. And one of my friends, Mike Ross, had a van. And he and and another friend, Donald, Donald Conti, we just said, let's start washing cars. And we used to go around washing cars and, and just getting cash, you know, for the weekend. My grandmother, who is the first saleswoman in Hollywood Sun Tatler history, talk about a boys club, sales at a, at a newspaper, first woman salesman, salesperson. She was, um, you know, working at Sun Tatler. She used to get me uh, business there in the parking lot. And then one of, her, one of the reporters wrote a little article about us and they went out in the paper. We got a bunch of calls. And so that was my first kind of enter, entry into self um governing. I had to get up. You had to work. And the more you work, the more you got. And and that made sense. Um, But that's not at 15. It wasn't a real business, but it was my first taste. Uh, Later, when I left the cable company, I ran all these contractors. I literally 
gave them work, did all their billing with them. I understood the ins and outs of contracting. So when I left the cable company, 2006, I went to work for another contractor uh, that I knew for 20 years or so, but he gave me a really unique opportunity to start my own little subcontracting firm within the company. So I basically give myself work. It was a real safe deal. It was really sweet. And so I got to start off in a real safe environment and nobody does that, but he had that much trust in me that I wouldn't fudge the numbers and all that stuff. And I never did, but um, I ended up growing that company pretty big. And in 2009, the housing bubble burst. And I had so much invested in that company that I had six new build projects to call where that was my forte that's where I worked and where they were building new houses. Six of them all closed within three weeks of Christmas in 2009. I lost that business. I had to go bankrupt. I had to, I, I lost a house. I lost, uh, I was divorced at that time. I had broken my leg severely playing flag football with the kids, which you should never do. My, my cape fell off that day. I became regular dad, so super dad. I didn't have a high school diploma. I was 40 years old sitting on a couch with nothing, no money, no home soon to be. $300,000, dollars dollars $500,000 in debt. And um, boy, talk about getting punched in the face and, and getting back up. I ended up taking a job again, going back to the private sector, working at a call center because someone told me this place is great to work for. I needed health insurance and I got a job. I went in asking for a hundred thousand a year. They gave me, a, they offered me 45,000 <laughs> to answer phones and sell. I've never sold anything, but I had a lot of interviews that went well. Turned out that job, because I went into it the same way. I wasn't mad that I was there. I was like, yes, I'm here. My first call, you know, I took and I didn't make a sale, but I talked to the lady for like 20 minutes. I got promoted to supervisor that day because I threw the script away and I started connecting with the person other than the line. And the supervisor of that sector, the manager heard that and actually promoted me. He's like, we need that spirit. I got promoted again three months later. I promoted again eight months later. I ended up being director of the whole division of uh, home security sales. And because of that, the I got an office on the director side or the executive side, this lady used to come and cut hair, okay? For the executives, that was a perk. And she was hot, hot barber. And they peeked their head in, James Flynn said, hey, the hot barber's here. I was like, all right, I'll go get my haircut. Didn't need one, I didn't have any money. I had $20 in my pocket for the whole week for lunch, it was a Tuesday. <coughs> and I went in and cut, she cut my hair and I tipped her the 20, cause that was customary, cause it was free. So the guy, the, my boss used to pay for it, the owner. That lady, we just talked, right? Now, I'm down on my luck. I was still only making like 60,000 a year. And I was, you know, 600,000, 500,000 in debt. I mean, it was a bad situation, but I had this great attitude and talking to her and we connected. That lady is my wife today. I <laughs> she was my wife today and I exactly. wouldn't have met her through, without that experience. And that is my partner. And her and I have this great business adventure going where we have, you know, we've got this great nucleus of our kids and they're very entrepreneurial also. So. I don't care how far down you are. Get up, pick that chin up. Yeah, you know? I love. That. And and before we go any further, I want to I want us to take a short break, and then when we come back, I want to talk about there's a uh, a chapter in your book called "Wasting Away in Operatorsville," and I that really caught my attention. And it really is about um, you know bringing on the right people and all of that, and and teaching and mentoring and 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 all of that. And but so to that note, we're going to go to a quick break. This week is Teacher Appreciation Week, so we want to say thank you.
I love that. And I, you know, of course, thank you to all of our teachers. It's been a really tough year for them. But when I listen to your story, right, you um, had a lot of people along the way, it sounds like, who taught you, right? Who took the time to nurture you, to build your skills, mentor you. Um, and I know that you have done the same for many as you've gone on through your career. But you talk a little bit in uh, Wasting Away, and I want to talk, I definitely want to get to your book for a second. What made you write it, of course? But in the book, you talk about the chapter Wasting Away in I'm got to sing it. What? Wasting it away in Operatorsville. Yeah, I was going to sing it, right? <laughs> so, and you talk about how. So you were the kind of person who it wasn't your business, but you really did treat it like it was your business. But in that chapter, you talk about how hard it is to find people, right? Yeah. Who have that mindset of, it, I may not own the business, but I'm going to treat it like it's my business because that's what got you ahead. How do you help instill that attitude right, in, in our young people or the people who come work for you, how do you make sure that they have that mindset? Can you teach that? Uh, well, the, I always say you cannot teach drive, okay? You cannot teach drive. Somebody has to want to want something. If they have drive, you can teach them almost everything else. And yes, I got to take this off because we're cooking in the kitchen and it's getting hot in here. I told you we're going to set off the smoke detectors. <laughs> we're, we're losing the blazer. So basically, if somebody wants something and you that's why when you hire somebody and that goes on like the, the second part of that book talks about the business elements and they kind of all they all are related you don't want to hire somebody let's say if you have a woodworking shop and you don't, you don't want to hire someone to cut wood you want to hire somebody who can learn all right so um if, if you're just hiring a, a laborer you're never going to get anyone to grow you might hire a lot of people. You're going to go through tons of interviews. No one's going to show up. Start interviewing people by asking the right questions to find out where their mind is at the beginning. Because even though they might not know it all, if they're asking the right questions and you're asking the right questions, and you get this dialogue going and you can see that they're quiz uh, inquisical. Uh, they're asking you a lot more questions and they really get into kind of the bigger picture of the business, not just the, the physical work. That's the kind of people that you want to hire people who want more out of life that knows that we're going to start here, but it's got a, it's got a, what I call it. And I said this on an interview a couple of years ago, it's like, there's a mountain in front of us and we have the tools to walk up that mountain. But as you get up there and you get better, you, you start instead of using those picks and all that, it starts to get a staircase. Eventually you're going to have an escalator and you're going to get to the top. It's actually going to get easier with the more skills you make. But as you get up top, the air gets thinner. And it's harder to breathe. So even though the skills are getting better, you have other obstacles. So as long as you're willing to learn those other obstacles and be open to learning about those things, you're going to go wherever you want to go in life. David Goggins changed my world when he talked about dying and going to heaven and having a board behind God or St. Peter or whatever your vision is. And it said, you know, ran all these hundred mile races and U.S. Navy SEAL three times, uh, first person to go three times to, to uh, through Hell Week. And he's like, what is that? And let's say he never did that. He was like, he used to kill cockroaches and he weighed 300 pounds. And God said, well, that's the stuff that you were supposed to do. I made you to do that. And he's like, no, but I'm 300 pounds. I kill cockroaches for 40 years. He goes, no, I made you to do that. And so he wanted to, you know, never experience that. So he does everything he can. So I took that and I tell people this, your future is already laid out. It's already laid out. But if you see it, you have to act. You can't. Reading is not action. Reading is preparation. You've got to act every day towards a goal. And that goal is going to move and that goal is going to change. That's fine. But if you're if it's meant for you, you're going to get there no matter the obstacle. If you keep just trying things that are not meant for you are not going to happen. And then you got to be OK with it. Just move on. Don't even think about it. Don't don't cry over it. Learn from it ask the questions. That's why I had so many mentors. I wasn't afraid to ask all those guys. I had to ask, how do you do a ground look day one? Well, that guy's a mentor, right? Did he know he was a mentor? No. This guy named Ron White, he helped me put a look, ground look on. Oh, now I know that's a mentor. I learned something from him because I asked. So don't, don't be afraid to ask. And I know I'm all over the place because 
Oh, but don't worry. All- I'm capturing all your ingredients as all you're connected. <laughs> <laughs> I always laugh. You know, Steve and I talk about podcasts and all that. And somebody asked me one day, you know, what's the key to it? And I said, listening really carefully because as people tell stories, right? It would be boring if you just came on here and gave me a list of the things that made you successful. It's through the stories that you're telling, right? That we get to know who you are and what those ingredients were. And so um, so I, I already have a really long list here, but I wanna get back to the book for a second. What made you want to write the story? Was it just wanting to share it with others or Not was it tragic? What what was it? No, so uh, the first uh, we got through the pandemic. I've been traveling Monday to Friday, or Monday really to Thursday the last couple of years. But for ten years now, almost every week, I travel about forty five weeks a year, all over the country to the Caribbean. Um, we have offices all over the, the country, and so I go to a different place every week and you know open up shops, hire people. Uh, or for the already entrenched, I take people, uh, make sure, take their temperature, meet with the clients, go out and see the guys working on the ground, digging, and make, you know, just kind of give them some tips. Uh, they, they hate when I show up to town. Uh, but, and they also like, they get to eat good steak when I'm in town too. So that's <laughs> a good thing. But basically, uh, COVID came, and luckily, two of my businesses, uh, one of them landscape, and the grass kept growing. So my kids, uh, we have a uh, landscape company, my youngest uh, yes, son, second youngest son, runs that and so that didn't go out of business that stayed strong we had to give about 10 people free cuts for about three or four months because they lost their jobs and Mm so we said we're we're, you're not going anywhere you're you're ours and uh my company rts uh i'm a kind of an employee but i have a vested interest of called a little bit of an ownership um equity ownership because i they value me so much they they really rewarded me for my efforts so but even before that, I treated it like my own. Even when I was sweeping that floor back in uh, 1990, I was the CEO of me. So these people that I'm with, they recognize that they gave me 10% ownership. So when I go around and I do all this stuff, um, I haven't been home for a long period of time in 10 years. And all of a sudden we're shut down. Workers kept working because we're out on the highways, but I'm not traveling. My job is to be on airplanes. Right. So after about three or four weeks, my family had a meeting and said, we don't work for you. <laughs> You're gonna fire me because I'm telling you what to do, and I can't help it. That's my, my my nature. So I'm turning 50 this month, May 28th, and I've got all these stories. You see, there there's all short stories. It's a really easy book to read. I went rated at G or maybe PG, sometimes PG 13, but um, it's a tip of the iceberg. I call it actually a tip of the iceberg because there's so much crap underneath there that I can still write about. But I want to just write those things down. It got me away from the family for hours at a time because I am obsessive when I start doing something. So I just started writing these memories down. And as I was writing them, I started seeing a pattern because it was like bad stories, right? But I didn't want to forget them. I wanted to acknowledge them and appreciate today or get get me in a better mood because I was not in a good mood at home. I was in a bad, bad kind of, I get depressive and everything, very dangerous. Um, So I started writing this stuff for cathartic reasons, but I saw a pattern of like fail, fail, fail. And then I saw success, right? And then as I kept writing, I was like fail, success, and then fail, but I kept going up and the stories kept getting different and better. And I started getting excited. And I started going, why did I succeed here? Oh, I asked that question of that person. This person came into my life and, you know, it was divine, you know, whatever you call that, it just happened for a reason. Right. I started going, wow, so maybe other people need to, to know that they're not alone going through this stuff. And, and maybe I could put my, my laundry out there and maybe I could help someone go, well, I had it not that bad. There's other people who had it a lot worse, but that can go, it didn't matter to him. Right. So maybe it didn't matter to me. And then yeah. I had the, the whole second part of the book, which is business, because the Noodleberg uh, huddle which I got turned on to at that time. Also, April 1st was my first time, April, uh, maybe April 10th. Um, I, I was just so entrenched in the business, the, the sales and stuff. So I started writing about business and how they, you know, intertwine with each other and how not to, how they can hurt you if you don't understand them. And Larry Long Jr. and Mark and, you know, everybody that we we deal with on that, that morning call, man, it's just, yeah. how can you not get excited and do something like this? I wrote this book in four yeah. months. 
I'm dyslexic. Yeah. I don't even read books. <laughs> but you can write them, right? <laughs> exactly. I, read now. I, read about, yeah. I read about a book a week now. And I think that's the key. Everybody in there is wanting to learn, right? Build relationships, which we also talk a lot about in the huddle, right? Building relationships that matter, not transactions all and all of that, um, which you obviously have mastered. And I love uh, the story of your son and that you are helping him now, right? To start his own business, which is going well, you shared, um, and, and helping him right, to have that start in entrepreneurism and and learning how to make it all work and the business side of it. Because I think we need that teacher, right? And so to that point of the teachers this week, um, it's so critical to have teachers in our lives, right? And also yeah. for us, as we go up the ladder or as we continue through our journeys to be teachers as well. And you've done both of those. And so I thank you for that. Um, and I'm, so I'm gonna- By the way, Lori, that never ends. I, know. I, I have professional teachers that I pay to teach me to this day, professional business coaches that I pay for my family to teach them to this right. day. This Noodleberg on the ball, you know, on the yeah. ball ventures, just to throw them a big uh, attaboy. Our whole family uses that system. It's never, you never stop learning and you don't, you should never try to stop saying that you have enough. I've never mastered anything because I keep asking questions. So I always I just say, yeah. Start. Right. What is it? Jack of all trades, master of none. Master right? of none. And, and we'll yeah. continue to want to be the master of something. Um, and I love that because that's definitely one of the ingredients. So I'm going to read back what I pulled from this story. Um, and then uh, your main ingredient might be in here. But if it's not, then I'm going to ask you, well, if it is, pull it out for me. And then I'm going to ask you, what is your main ingredient to success? So some of the things that I heard you talk about were um, right. Building your confidence. you got to have that confidence, the right attitude. And that comes up here several times in this in this story, in this uh, conversation. Initiative. I think, gosh, if I've heard you talk through anything. Right. I, you can call it initiative. You can call it go get it done. Oh, wow. You can call it self-discipline. You can call it grit. You can call it hard work aspiration. I mean, all these words, right? You put them all into a bucket. And that is what really was that for me, at least what I pulled out the driving force for you. You always said yes, no matter what the job was, right? You just always said yes. And that is key. Um, an attitude of gratitude, right? Always being grateful for the opportunities for things that come our way. Um, trust the voice in your head. I love that too often, right? My, for me, it's my gut, right? Follow my gut, same Thank idea. Right. Uh, having mentors, being a mentor, building trust, right? People have to trust you. They want to do business with you. They want to come along with you, whether it's an employee, you've got to build that trust. Um, mm -hmm. Got to get back up when you fall down, right? You talk a lot about that. Um, hire people who want to learn, right? And you talk a lot about that constant growth mindset, right? Always be learning something new. And you also talk about investing in yourself. Sometimes you got to pay to learn, right? Yeah, exactly. But what yeah. better investment is there than in your growth and your leadership and your learning? Um, ask questions, curiosity. I think too often our young people today, right? I hope that we don't squash their curiosity because we yeah. just always have to be asking questions. My daughter always says that to me. Like, why do you, you meet someone and you ask them a million questions? Like, why are you so nosy? I'm like, I'm not nosy. I want to hear their story, right? That's why I have a podcast because I want to hear people's story. I want to know all about them, right? Um, How's your mom and them? That, what's that? How's your mom and them? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I think that's how we learn. Right. By by asking all the questions of people. Perseverance obviously constantly comes through. Um, take action every day. Keep mo moving forward. Um, and um, what what I think really, really, you know, move on when something doesn't feel right. And I love this one. Be the CEO of you. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and that's so important. I always said, you know, when I when I was a stay at home mom, I was the CEO of the household uh, because it is like running a business. Right. Um, but I love I just love, Jeremy, that you didn't let where you started define where you ended up. And I think that is um, that's such a major part of the story. So all of those amazing ingredients, author, leader, 
Tell us, Jeremy Torsk, what is the main ingredient to your success? Well, let me backtrack just two seconds because I have an answer for that. But the yes thing, always say yes. That's not always true. Also, I've got to remember, it is okay to say no also. But mm. at least you're controlling it. So no is a good thing. Can't always say yes to everything. But when people ask me about work and stuff later in life with sales, you got to learn how to say no. Um, also, uh, taking a risk, getting out there and just acting. So I have a saying that my last name is to risk and my blood type is actually B positive. So for me, it's just in my DNA and I'm here to go, but just act, go and do it. Don't prep. Uh, it's not just about the prep. It's about action, which leads right. me to my most important ingredient. Prepping is something that you do to prepare for action. I have gotten humongous hundred million dollar deals after coming right off of a Tony Robbins uh business mastery seminar going into this multi huge I shouldn't have got this job it was uh my competition were giants and I was a little fly I got the job we got we our company got the job because of the mindset being prepared to go into that meeting and saying the right words however why was I prepared even for this interview you're going to succeed if you prepare never walk into a meeting without a pen and paper to take a note ever go into every boss's office they ever call you any meeting you ever go to pen and paper Number two, I got an iPad sitting right here with this book, uh, table of contents up, 27 rules, right, of um, engagement for influencing leaders, um, confessions of a serial salesman. There's the 20, 22 chapters right there out of 27. It's just there in case I need to think of something, right? Do what? I just look at it. I oh, it's, it's important. That book. Yeah, author. Yeah, we might know that uh, that guy, Steve Noodleberg. But it's here because if you ask me a question that I I go blank, I'm prepared. I go boom. Oh, wake up early. That's a good one. Wake up early. Like right? you ask me a question, I don't know. Oh, act like it's your first day. I thought of that. Act like it's your first day. You don't know. I'm looking at it. Be prepared, but act. I'm prepared here. I'm prepared here, but I'm acting here. Love it. Be prepared, and then act. I always and have to act. Love it, love it. Preparation is not action. Amazing story. Um, I look forward to continuing to learn and hear and applaud your journey and all that you'll continue to accomplish. I'm looking forward to the next book. We posted in the site, in the chat for people, if you'd like to read Jeremy's book, you can certainly go on to Amazon and purchase it. Um, so I know there'll be a second one. Um, hopefully it won't be because yeah. we're in a pandemic. Uh, no. And you need something to do. Yeah. Um, but book, I, by the way, on Amazon, is that a zero profit margin? It's at like I get thirty cents a copy. I lowered it to the price that I legally can sell it for on Amazon. They won't let you sell it for zero, or else I would give it away. Uh, it's like two dollars or ninety nine cents for the ebook. I make no money. I didn't write this book for money. I wrote it to help people, and it gives me a ticket to get on shows like yours, so I could talk to more people, and that leads to helping more people. That's the whole reason for this book. So get it. it listen, for your people, message me. I'll mail you a book for free, right? Uh -huh. I got 50 okay. of them at home. I'll mail your people a book for free if they just put it, uh, message me in uh, LinkedIn or Facebook, wherever. I'm everywhere. Jeremy Torres.com. We'll put that on social media when we post the, uh, the interview for people that if they'd like to learn more about you, read your book, get a copy of your book to contact you. Jeremy, I wanna say thank you so much for joining me this morning. I absolutely love your energy, uh, your grit, your, yeah, I just love all that, right? Um, and so again, glad that we have crossed paths. Uh, love having people like you in my life, so positive. Keep influencing more and more people and just keep, st keep staying on the ball, right? As Steve would say. Absolutely. And, yeah. and we're, we're back in the, and we're being back in the we're back in the junior achievement uh, mentorship internship program this summer. We're going to rock it over there at J World. I cannot wait for it. We're excited, the whole family. Love it. And thank you for that because you know what? I think we all have to invest, right, in the next generation of our workforce, right? They're, they're yep. going to be the ones taking care of us someday. So yep. hats off to Anna for all her hard work because I wouldn't have any of this opportunity without her shepherding She's me terrific. through the system. Yeah. She is awesome. And if anybody is interested in an internship uh, this summer, we have some amazing kids. Jeremy certainly can tell you uh, yeah. how rewarding it was this summer. So thanks again for being with us. Thanks everyone for watching. And we look forward to seeing you on the next episode of JA's Recipe for Success. Let's get cooking.